Most adult responsibilities okay, but around cars I just turn adolescent. Next to ladies, I suppose a race car has to be the most exotic thing around. Being alone on that track in that car is kicky, but I want to make it very clear that it's just that. It's kind of just running in a plane. It's not racing. I mean, racing is 30 or 40 other cars on the track with you and clanging fenders that speeds up to 200 miles an hour. Upon a week, you got to be the moving, moving faster to make that wheel know you're the master. You don't know it might never come down. You know what this reminds me of? A theater. An empty theater right now. But it has its audience, its cast, drama, comedy, and sometimes it's tragedy, too. 
The spectacle here is a moving play on an asphalt stage with all the props. Producers and directors in the wings, the music, extras, comedians, good guys and bad guys, and the stars, the players who get the most out of it because they put the most into it. Uh, I think it's up to the individual how bad he wants to race or how bad he wants to do the thing he wants to do. The money's good. Um, it's exciting. You see a lot of the world. All those things make it a damn fine job. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Well, I guess I race because uh, that's the only thing I really know how to do. I love driving. I love competition. I love the exhilaration. My racing commitment is 24 hours a day. Just in it for the sort of love of the game as well as the commercial side. Racing is what I call my life. Very satisfying. I race just because I really enjoy it. Actually, every single moment of the arrival of the meeting is a race for me. This has been a, a lifelong ambition for me since I've been in racing, to be the Grand National Champion. I have a lot of good friends that was the champion years before me, and I like uh, when we're standing around to feel that, that I'm as good as they was. Race drivers have to be proud people in order to want to, uh, to work and to want to excel the way we do. So we take pride in whatever we do. Michael especially is beginning to show a bit of daredevilish attitude. He just likes anything motorized. I've uh, had a uh, tremendous amount of resistance from my immediate family when I began to drive race cars, primarily because they didn't really understand the whole thing. Mario's right. Few people really understand what racing is to the driver. Let's ride with Indianapolis winner Mario Andretti and get a sense of the history that's made the oval at Indianapolis the granddaddy of all racetracks.
Will it be your first car? Or maybe you're looking forward to it. Maybe you're still driving it, for that matter. Mine was a junk heap that I paid $150 for. Whatever. There's not much comparison between that and this uh, racing stock car here, except that you have to take them both in to get them serviced. In racing, quickness counts. Did you ever try to get a tire change and a tank of gas in 25 seconds? Well, try it the next time you're in at your local service station. Or better still, don't. Just leave it to the pit stop crew of a Grand National stock car. But even half a minute or less can be a long time when you're trying to catch the leader. And for the driver who needs a little help quick, it's got to seem like the whole world's running in slow motion. Buddy, can you spare the time to help a friend in need? Oh, I need a little help right now. Buddy, can you spare the time to do me one good deed? Oh, I need a little good deed now. Time to help a friend in need Oh, I need a little help right now Oh, I need a little help right now On one hand, it seems like slow motion On the other hand, not so fast Turn back the clock and look at what men built and raced with a lot of pride and passion in another era. This little bit of nostalgia that I'm driving is a French-built Peugeot that came in second at Indianapolis in 1914. It did over 100 miles an hour on the straightaway 60 years ago. While we're here, let's take a ride back in time to when it all started with the automobile. At the turn of the century, Americans first heard the sound of gasoline engines and saw the beginning of motorized wheels. Cars were the novelty of the day, and people either loved them or hated them. Some even thought they knew how to drive them. As soon as cars and racing started to make it, Hollywood began cranking out films with every sight gag in the book. More than one kid believed that this was the way it really was. And a new generation caught the car bug and couldn't be cured. Everybody got into the act. Charlie Chaplin did his own number on the drivers of the 1914 Santa Monica Grand Prix. The movies gave us one side, reality showed us another. And after a while, we began to wonder about these things called cars, if they weren't out to get even with us. The theory was, build a lot of cars the same and they'll be better. So, the production line. Almost every car off the line, there was somebody out there with an urge to change it, for better or for worse. The idea was to experiment, to make things different. Practicality had nothing to do with it.
Cicero said that everything splendid is rare, and nothing is harder to find than perfection. Elegance was for the people with the tango in their head, the money in their pockets, and the ego to own the very best. But most people went along with the trend. And besides, production cars made more sense. We passed the innocent years, came out of the war, danced away the 20s, felt the depression, and then got behind the wheel again. Racing became the rage on board tracks, dirt ovals, or up Pike's Peak. Nothing else mattered as long as the driver's right foot was all the way to the floor. At Indianapolis, there was more going on than just floorboard driving. Great names in racing were becoming household words. Shaw, Frame, Myers, Cummings. And the cars had new stature, too. They weren't home-built experiments anymore. They had power, sophistication, and agility. They were thoroughbred. We always wanted to go faster than the other guy. And the land speed record runs started the ladder up, first on the Daytona Sand, then on the Bonneville Salt. 200, 300, 400. 500, 600, 622 miles an hour. And Gary Gablick finally broke Craig Breedlove's record with a rocket-powered car. But now Breedlove says he's coming back with his own rocket and his own vision of what it all means to be the fastest man on wheels. A milestone in the history of racing. When I crashed my first jet car in 1964 at, at 500 miles an hour, I uh, was very frightened. The new car has a potential of, of probably a thousand miles an hour. I frankly hope I don't have to drive it that fast. I've been up to Frisco for the sprints, out to Charlotte to see the stocks, into the Glen for the Grand Prix. Indy for the drag and for the big one. Springfield for the dirt track, Ontario for the 500, Sebring for the 12 hours, and Daytona for the 24. I paid $200 million to sit with 40 million fans. I've eaten 20 tons of hot dogs and drunk a Rose Bowl full of pop. I'm this year's spectator, Race Fan USA. Spectator's day is a long one, full of aching feet, dust in your eyes, maybe too many hot dogs, and that inevitable separation between you and the real life of the drivers, the guys behind the wheel out there. But we enjoy it here, and without us, there would be no race at all. And when it's all over, there's a feeling that even as tired as you are, you still hate to leave the theater where the drama was played. Oh, in the evening. Feel alone last. All of the things that the daytime brings. I guess everybody who sits up here in the stands as a spectator would like to get out there on the track and drive, and every once in a while you get a chance. That's me down there, practicing for the annual Ontario Motor Speedway Celebrity Pro Am race for charity. There are seven cars, 14 drivers for the race. Wilt Chamberlain had a real problem. 
great car. <laughs> Keep one leg outside and drag your foot. We all got together with Kirk Douglas to kick up our heels and have a little fun for charity. My co-driver was Indianapolis winner Parnelli Jones. Hugh Downs was teamed with Mark Donahue. The astronaut Pete Conrad with Mario Andretti. Golf pro Ken Venturi shared his car with a 1970 Indianapolis winner, Al Unzer. Dino Martin was driving with a guy who won Indianapolis twice, Roger Ward. Dick Smothers with another Indy winner, Bobby Unzer. Tennis champ, Pancho Gonzalez, was paired with Dan Gurney. And Kirk Douglas with David Lockton, president of the Speedway, and along with Kirk, organizer of the event. I, I don't want to play, but I got to play golf. Otherwise, I'd like to be with you. Don DeFore and Artie Johnson were in the pit crews. So were Glenn Ford, Chad Everett, Chuck Connors, Gail Fisher, a gang of others. Are you kidding? I wouldn't even drive on a freeway that long here. I'm chicken. Uh, what I'm afraid of is this crowd. If they asked me to MC this thing, I wouldn't feel bad at all. Uh, but I, the idea of these people watching me drive a car makes me nervous as a cat. All right. Have you ever driven one of these? No. I tried about it. Okay. My pit crew was Stephen Boyd, Lou Rawls, and J.C. Agajanian. There were going to be three pit stops when Parnelli and I would change off driving. The race itself was to be 12 laps, or about 40 miles. We watched Kirk's flag, then made the Le Mans start dash to tag our teammates and send them on their way. The pros took off first. It's very difficult now to stay unexcited. I don't think the danger is involved. There's a lot of skill and technique. Once you see, uh, like I've been in the car with Dan Gurney, and I see his skill and technique, and I can see how he really minimizes whatever danger there is. I didn't feel scared at all with him. Yeah, he went around much faster than I did. The pit stops were something like a three-ring circus, with everybody cheating like hell. Parnelli told me that there was a rumor going around that Al Unzer dropped eight pounds out of our back tires to slow us down, but we were still in there running, trying hard to hold on to our brilliant position. Sixth place in a seven-car race. Dick Smothers and Bobby Unzer, teamed in car number three, were going great. After two spin-outs, they managed to come back into second place chasing Pete Conrad. It started looking like a real race, except some of the guys were cutting corners, shortening the course by as much as half a mile. And, well, I would have been doing the same, except Parnelli coasted in for the last pit stop and banged behind the helmet and said, you got a little problem here, Buster. No transmission and no clutch. I'm down, but I ain't out. Hey, what happened to Paul? Uh, he blew up or something. Well, there are the winners, Dick Smothers and Bobby Unzer, in the first annual Ontario Celebrity Pro-Am race. But I finished anyway, bummed a ride in a pace car and finished dead last. Nobody else could claim that. I killed him on the straightaway. I want to just burn him. The motion picture and television relief fund is to be a benefactor of these proceedings here today. In some kinds of racing, women are still barred from the pits. But in sports car racing, in Can-Am and Formula One, to mention a few, the girls are doing their thing, without complaints, keeping time charts, clicking stopwatches, running for sandwiches, whatever. We love them. We wouldn't have it any other way. How do some of the drivers feel about it? Mel Kenyon, for instance. Without an uh, understanding wife, a guy just couldn't do this. Lynn, you're married to uh, Jackie Oliver, who's a pretty quick man on the Grand Prix circuit. Do you ever talk about the danger at all together, or do you kind of sit on it, or the wives talk about it, or what? Yes, we do. We talk about it amongst ourselves. Yeah, we don't, we don't really talk about it to our husbands, because we know they're going to go on racing. And uh, this is what they want to do. This is what they're happy doing. There are problems, and they're under tension, so you control your own problems and tensions. And two, you have to face facts, and it might possibly be the last time you see a person when they go out to race, so you don't bother to argue. You're, you're nice all the time. When the wife next to me started screaming and yelling, and I sat there and I got scared, and I never was afraid before. 
The best thing one can do is make sure you're really well financially secured. You have to let a boy or a man do what they want to do. Paul says um, it isn't really racing. But I always wonder what happens if he's going 170 miles an hour out there and something breaks. I'd like just a few more hours alone every day. You get to all of them. I beg your pardon. You go to all of his races. I didn't go to all of them over here this summer, but in general I go to all the races. Mostly, yes. I try to go to as many as possible. It's much better to be at a race than to be sitting at home waiting for news of a race. In racing, for the man, there is nothing else but the action he lives in and controls. For a woman, it's a very different thing. finish line, the beginning and the end. Doesn't make any difference whether it's painted on asphalt or drawn in dirt with a stick. It's become a symbol of our civilization. That great divider between the winners and the also ran. Yesterday, who would have thought that the earth would have been the start finish line in our race to the moon? I don't know. Sometimes I think that uh, a line is drawn and then some people get off in a corner and figure out just what the hell they're going to do with it. It might be said that the human animal is a very competitive, escalating beast. And it all starts very simply, trying to beat the kid next door. The annual Soapbox Derby at Akron, Ohio. 300 boys from all over the world have built their own cars to race just like the big guys. The Derby is attended by some well-known guests, James Drury, astronaut Dick Gordon, and the race MC, Lauren Green. and a very 
best regards to all of you, and our best wishes to all the champions who are here from all over the United States. The flag is at the ready. Bend them up! This is that wild, wonderful flight of imagination at work. It's finding our way into our own mind. It's our first car. It's being alive. And if you're a weekend racer, you can find it anywhere. I kicked off my shoes. I felt the good earth under my feet. I loosened my tie. And felt what it feels like to breathe. I found the secret to life. I took some time. are good times, a time for living, an adventure that has no serious future beyond Sunday afternoon. Then somewhere, it's hard to say exactly where or when, the game simply is no longer a game. It becomes a man's life. The minor leaguers join the majors. Hard cash replaces the Lover's Cup trophy. And that escalation that drives us all is off and running. You can see it happen on the local drag strip. And if you look hard enough, you can see tomorrow's Andretti's, Foyt's, and Unser's there too. Racing has its own ladder of success. At the top of the world of big stock cars is Richard Petty, who's won more major stock car races than anyone in history. Well, if there was any race that we'd get up for, it would be probably Daytona Beach or something like this, which is uh, probably the biggest prestige race we have. I was born with a silver wheel in my mouth And when I got old enough I drove it south Down to the dirt tracks to get a start I didn't know a lot about racing But I talked the part And they said, put your wheels where your mouth is, boy So I moved right on up to a $50 car With a few thousand more I knew I'd be a star With a hopped up, propped up, clunky wreck I knew it wasn't much, but it was racing and I said, Daytona, you're next. Well, I ate dust and bad food, drank from a jar. And when things got bad, I even slept in that car. With a drip pan, dirty nails and grease in my hair. I knew it wasn't much, but it was racing. But I didn't know where. And I still don't. I've been a pit man, a flag man, a gas man, a tow man, many a man just to run a car. I haven't had a run of luck to get me far. I know it ain't much, but it's racing. And someday I'm gonna be a star. All right, boys, let's roll it on out. Oh, that's a 
operating machine. Enclosed bodies, brute power, and some of the best drivers from Europe and North America. This is the Can-Am plateau of racing. You can't appreciate what tremendous satisfaction it is to get one particular corner right. Driving a car, not, not just sheer speed, but the exhilaration of the control of a vehicle, the control of speed. It is a great art of driving a racing car. It's an art of balance and feeling and understanding of the machine, and you feel it through your hands and through, and through the seat of your pants. The championship trail is the road to the Indianapolis 500. Open wheel cars that every time out teach their drivers a little more about racing. If you start spinning, or about the only thing you can do is just stand on the brakes and hope for the best. Because the car's got a mind of its own and it's going to go where it wants. I think my goal specifically, I would like to win the Indianapolis 500 and eventually I'd like to win the World Championship in a Formula One car. at the end of the Indianapolis race. She said, well, how did it go? And he said, well, I, I guess I took a couple of chances that I shouldn't have. Or, you know, what did he mean by that? And do you think that's part of the drive that it, it, in order to win the races, you really do have to take those chances? Somebody that's been in a sport a long time, you're, you're comfortable at 150 miles an hour. You don't, that doesn't seem fast, and you make decisions at that speed and with things going by like that. So it's, it's like uh, uh, driving your family car downtown on the freeway. I'm not in really as much of a danger as uh, some people might think. And I'm willing to uh, take the risk. When I get into situations that are close or scary on the racetrack involving other cars, that, that can be frightening. Fashioned after Indianapolis, but with a new flair for glamour and style in the California sun, this is Hollywood's version of championship racing. The track itself cost $25 million. And for opening day, spectators bought 180,000 tickets to be part of a once-in-a-lifetime race at the Ontario Motor Speedway, the first California 500. I'm 70 years old, and this is undoubtedly the most exciting experience of my whole life. And I know when they say, gentlemen, start your motors, I'm going to cry. Gentlemen, start your engine. names in racing lead the way. Then near the end of the race, the favorites started dropping out. Overheating, engines room, suspension gone. And the inaugural California 500 became a Cinderella story. At the finish in car number 14, Jim McElreath is the winner. One of the oldest drivers in the track, a man who had never won a major race in over 20 years, competing against the biggest prize winners of them all. He stayed in and hung on cautious man who played it right and won. To make the presentation to the first winner here in Ontario. Governor, this is really a very proud moment for all of California. The place is Europe, or it can be Canada, South Africa, the United States. But more than glamorous names and places, it is a state of mind, an expression of the ultimate in racing, the Formula One, World Driving Championships, the Grand Prix. From Nürburgring to Germany to the Players Grand Prix sanctioned by the Canadian Automobile Sports Club. This is the top.
I've gone to Des Coin, down to Atlanta, up to Monterey, up to Ontario, the big O. I saw the celebs. Watched a guy named Newman lose a transmission and come in dead last. I gotta get going. It's all over. Everybody's gone home. But they'll all be back. Especially the drivers. They always come back, those guys. You know, they have a great and strange heritage in this life. Something few of us will ever feel. Because they are the modern gladiators. They're scientists who have discovered the miracle of speed. They're explorers probing the outer reaches of man's limitations. In the age when time seems to fly right by us, who can't but feel a twinge of admiration and awe for the men who see time as an enemy to be defeated on its own battleground? These racers, the men, these are the brave ones. We, well, we're just the spectators. <laughs>